Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of the New York Times. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the latest event in our Times Talks live event series, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, fashion, literature, politics, and social policy. Today, we're pleased to present our first ever art and design festival, three provocative conversations exploring the intersection of art, architecture, fashion, and design, produced in collaboration with New York City by Design. I would like to give special thanks to our sponsor, DXV, and to share the following brief video message. The Hugo Modern Bathroom parallels the landscape. You're basically impacted by the water, and then with the natural landscape behind, it heightens your experience, and thereby you're enhancing your life and attaining Hugo. And now down to business. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's final event featuring the legendary artist Christo. Celeb yeah, absolutely. Christo is celebrated worldwide for environmental works that are monumental yet ephemeral. Tonight, Christo will share highlights of the extraordinary five decades of projects he's created in conjunction with his wife and artistic partner, Jean-Claude, as well as his current work in progress, The Mastaba. Following his presentation, he'll be joined on stage by a New York Times culture reporter who knows his life and his work quite well. It's my pleasure to introduce her now for a brief appreciation of Christo's life and work. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to tonight's host, New York Times culture reporter, Robin Pogrebin. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's a, a very uh, special night for me. I was uh, fortunate enough to interview Christo and Jean-Claude in 2004 just before what many of you may recall was the unveiling of the gates in Central Park, um, which were 23 miles of billowing saffron-colored fabric all along the paths of Central Park. There were 7,500 gates, and it drew people from all over the world. You might also know this uh, amazing couple from their wrapping of the Reichstag in Berlin or the 3,100 umbrellas deployed along inland valleys in Japan and California or the floating piers of 2016 at Lake Iseo in northern Italy, a glowing walkway connecting an island in the lake with the shore that drew 1.2 million visitors. Now Christo is working on a trapezoidal mastaba this summer in Hyde Park in London that will be made up of 7,506 oil barrels and float on the Serpentine Lake behind Kensington Palace. It is to be unveiled in June, I think June 20th, in conjunction with an exhibit at the nearby Serpentine Galleries that will include drawings and sculptures and um, photographs that span Christo's more than 50 years of work. He has plans to build a permanent one in Abu Dhabi, and if he pulls that off, it would be the largest art structure in the world, 50 times the size of the one that's about to open in London. So now without further ado, Christo is going to talk about that project and others, and then I'm going to join him for a brief conversation, and then we will open it to questions from all of you, so please get them ready. And now, welcome Christo. Thank you, thank you. I come here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away. <laughs> okay. I'm here for you, okay? Okay. <laughs> Do your thing. What? No, you're going to show us, talk to us. Okay. Try. Before the starting, I always try to think what Jean-Claude was saying before. You know, I, I miss her all the time because she was a much better speaker. Actually, I never learned to speak English or French. And <laughs> And uh, she was saying very important things. One thing is that myself and Jean-Claude we were born the same day, the same year, June 30, 1935, by two different mothers. <laughs> I met her in Paris in 1958. We lived in Paris until 60, 1964. And we immigrated to the United States. Jean-Claude, no, no, we don't immigrate to the United States. 
when we get to Manhattan, New York City, <laughs> and we still live in the same place since 1964. <laughs> By the way, I can tell you, I, I come, I'm a political refugee, I come here like uh, uh, immigrant, you know, stateless actually, with no nationality, and I was for three years, three years illegal alien. <laughs> Today I'm American citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we will go with the, with the images to give a little hint what was done and how we can uh, think about and ask me questions. Now, let's put everything dark. I don't read. It's possible. Let's make things dark okay. for our slideshow. Yeah, because it's, okay. Uh, it will be nicer if it will be dark. Anyway, that is the project we did in Australia called Rap Coast in 1969. It's the huge coastline, one and a half miles near the, uh, Sydney, and, and you can be seen from all high cliffs to beach area. And then Valley Curtain was the project we did in Colorado, 1972, huge orange curtain, the site of Brooklyn Bridge, and the center is 180 feet, and the main foundation 100, 360 feet. In uh, between 1972 and 1976, we did that project in Northern California, so now Marin County, well, uh, is the 16, uh, 18 feet tall fence running for 24 and a half miles to Sonoma in Marin County, and the western extremity of the fence disappear in the Pacific Ocean. You see that little person here to save the sky, the, the fence. In 1978, we did Rub Walkway in Kansas City, in Missouri, and Loose Park. And in 1983, we did Surrounded Town. This is the seven um, miles island, 11 islands from the south to north and Biscayne Bay, Florida, surrounded with pink fabric. The fabric was attached to the beach area, floating for 220 feet on the surface of the water, ending with the octagonal shaped booms. This is all temporary project, you know, they stay for two weeks. That's it. Finally, after 10 years working, we finally we get the permission to wrap the oldest bridge on the Paris Pont Neuf in September of 1985. And over near 3 million people walk on the bridge. The bridge was littered because it's a historical landmark uh, from the government of France. And <clears throat> 1979, 19, <laughs> 1991, uh, we did the umbrellas joint project for J Japan in the United States. There were 1,340 blue umbrellas in Japan, 1,760 yellow umbrellas in Southern California, very near, close near the uh, in Los Angeles K County and Kern County. And in 19, after almost uh, 20 years of work, in 1995, we wrapped the Reichstag, the former parliament of Germany. We started in 1972. We have a three refusal, and finally we get permission in 1974. We have the Reichstag with one, one, one million square feet of fabric and about 20 miles of rope, and that is the most visiting project. We have a five million people in two weeks. And in 1998, uh, we wrap three. And Beroma Park in Switzerland, we have a sunny days, we have a winters, this concrete, we have a sunset. And finally, in 19 in 2005, we did the gates. Take us 26 years. The project started in 79, and was realized in, uh, in 2005, we have a 7,000 factory gate running to the uh, Central Park. Jean-Claude was, was saying, no, sure, but we have even snow. And there was a snow on this beautiful day of February, and see part of the gates looking to the south. And in 19, <coughs> now, another type of project I did, using the oil barrels. This long story starts in the late 50s, and 19, 1962. This is the second uh, is, uh, is temporary installation, Chanko and myself, we did it, is in Paris. I was political refugee, I was stateless, there was a Cold War, and Berlin Wall was built in 1961, and this is my response to the Berlin Wall, the iron curtain of oil barrels, and small street and Rivers County in Paris, in 1962, in June. And of course, using these oil barrels, I start to do sculpture, actually, this sculpture of oil barrels in the museum in Milano Foundation. And that, such, that type of thing can, is cylindrical objects stacking together. Angle is over 60 degrees. In the middle of 60, I propose to build Bastaba between Houston and Galveston, and we never get permission. Now, that shape is not a pyramid. In the Holland, uh, there was another chance, uh, also we never get permission. And finally, in 19, 79, we arrived in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, to propose the build that that must have been, who is actually, that one, a meter at 500 feet tall by 700 feet, feet by that 1,000 feet. Is the, uh, as you see, there are 410,000 barrels. 
and created that special mosaic. This is a scale model. I did it in the late 70s using for the working the permission. I will show the, how this is sand Jean-Claude Marc collected for the scale model. Here you can see the in the place where they hope to do the project. And the last time Jean-Claude arrived there was before she passed away, was in 1987 in the sites of uh, near Abu Dhabi. But all these projects, they're so complicated. It's so difficult. To, we don't do it ourselves. We need to have engineers. The gentleman of Mustache is Professor Suzaki, University of Jose of Tokyo, who proposed the most innovative idea to build that project. Nothing in the world is built like that. And I will show you how it will happen. It is the basically, Vladimir, you are basically look at what happened. Entire project will be flat. It will be installed in two weeks. <laughs> this is a huge, and you see, there are railroad tracks, because these walls, they are uh, 70 feet depth walls. And hydraulically, they were installed in two weeks, 410,000 barrels. And this is the, the scope of the project. You see the pyramid of Giza and the Masala. <laughs> <laughs> and without knowing, you know, this is the special proportion. It's 234. The footprint of Masaba is Bernini Square at Rome and Vatican. You see, that is a Now, using that little scale model, not the big scale model, we need to orient the, the vertical wall with the rice. Now, I'll give you the idea. This is the footprint of Mastaba. You see the little cars? This is a, and I will show you how tall the Mastaba with the landscape. You see the little car? The little balloon there is the height of the Mastaba. You know, now, to do very much like today, I lecture to many people, the uh, Women University of Abu Dhabi, uh, Z University. And of course, I will show you some uh, more recent drawings to see the situation. They have a little circle where the proposal the Master Babui. And 19, late 1999, we did a project, indoor installation in a museum in Germany, Oberhausen. We built 13,000 oil barrels in the big atrium, 100, almost 100 meters. We have an elevator you can see from above. And now we go to the idea the floating Master Babui was not right away to lay, 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 was the idea that I propo proposed to collect to build a Lake Michigan in 19. 67, that was never built, only stay in drawings. And now finally, we build the Mastaba and uh, uh, Lake, uh, Serpentine Lake. And you see that uh, the, the Mastaba will be in that area with all these anchors. We re really move, we will move, we will not anchor to the bottom of the, and the proposal is done, it will be 20, 20 meter high by 30 meter and 40 meter. Now, uh, to ending with more uh, exciting things, Floating pier was not right away for break sale. The floating pier, this is in 1970, we tried to do it. We needed water. And the Delta of Rio de la Plata in Argentina, we never get permission. In the late mid 90s, Jean Claude, we have a lot of friends in Japan, we tried to do it in the Bay of Tokyo, we never get permission. And finally, we work hard. And when, the, when Jean Claude passed away, I was saying, I like to do something that I don't know how much I will live. And we go to the north of Italy, you see the Lake is sale. I know that from the time I live and eat uh, uh, in France, we spend a lot of friends. This is the mountain in the middle. This is the Mount Monte Isola, where people live. They have on a bridge. If for 16 days, they walk in the water to go to the, their homes. And this is a little sketch. And this is our working yard. Imagine this is the working yard, the most beautiful vista working yard, to install three kilometers, almost two, only over two miles floating pier on uh, two and a half kilometers of pedestrian street. You know, that is special cube was positioned. They float. It's like a beach. This is installed 100 and 200 anchors down to the water. Each of them is a 50 tons, five, five tons. And there was the uh, deep water diver attaching the anchor to the, keep the geometry of the, of the floating pier. And this is the early drawings of that period. This is the drawings I sell to build millions of euro, millions of dollars project. This is our working site in Niseo. This is our staging area, parking area of 100 meters that will be moved to the side and do the job. This is the, the workers connected these cubes. They float them. They position it in the right place. We helicopter bring the fabric we installed before the cubes, special fabric, finding the L fabric, Dali fabric. That is satellite view of the project. And Vladimir will show you past some images before the open for the public. And you see here the people walking. What is important, I think, look at, this is the not little lake. The water depth is the 300 feet depth. What is there? There are no rail. <laughs> there are no rail. The people walking, there are no, 
And there, uh, 1,250,000 people work on 16 days. And, and, and day and night, we have a specially uh, fabricated from United States lamps installed that the people can work in the evening. And we'll show some moving images how it has happened and that. Did anyone it, fall in or jump in? No. Nobody. No. <laughs> there was the hour. You know, the, you see how the edge, they wet like a beach. Yes. They're sloping. And the people pre not prevent them, but also have a security people walking around. And it was uh, and the longest day of the year in late June. Okay, thank Bravo. you. Bravo. <laughs> now, uh, Robin, okay. you asked me a question, but also you feel, you, if you have a courage, you, you, some of you probably can ask questions. Yes, and okay. when we do go to questions, we have two no, mics we, in the we aisles. You did very so. well. And um, I'll give you a heads up when we get close to that. But I, I think we should first start with talking about why I am sitting and you are not. <laughs> so that it's not as if I am not giving this nice no, man who's about to turn 83 a, 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 pla a place to rest. No, I tell you, you know, I love to, very important thing is that I love real things. I do not know how to use the computer. My, my nephew, the friends, they use the computer. I do not know how to drive. Never learned how to drive. I do not like the, the telephone. I like real people, like the real things. I like to have a real five kilometer, the real wind, the real water, no virtual reality. And I love to film myself. I exist in my studio, there are no stool. I work nonstop and I feel very. Now, we, jean and myself, we find a house in, in Soho. We lived there since 1964. And that old house built in the 19th century, though there are no elevators, there are 90 steps. I know how many times a day I climb 90 steps. Jean Claude installed an electric, electric check, chair to bring uh, a senior citizen collector who come to buy. <laughs> that they can <laughs> climb the stairway, but basically like that. And I enjoy it, I enjoy it. And you see all these projects, they happen in the real world, meaning the real world. They are not film of water, they are not film of snow, there's real snow. These senses, I'm almost evil, um, like in French is called evil, like uh, evrone, uh, uh, drunk of that reality. I love the real things, I enjoy it tremendously. I like the real people the real human beings, and this is something I cannot, cannot pass without that. So standing and walking around is real no, no, to but you? No, but because the project involves a lot of walking. Right, really. so you stay in shape like this. No, no, no. Okay. No, no. And, and while we're on your personal habits, before we get into your career, I was struck, um, Christo spoke at the New York Times Art Conference in Doha a year ago, and you talked about your eating habits, which really stayed with me because you practically starve yourself. But I think it would be interesting to just talk about, uh, talk about your no, daily I, I routine. I like to have an empty stomach because keep me very edgy and energetic. Uh, <laughs> if I eat, I'm a little sleepy. And uh, I have very simple thing. In the morning, you know, that is my Bulgarian heritage. Uh, I, I eat yogurt and garlic. You know. I that chop was garlic the yogurt and garlic. Food. Put it in the, in the, the bowl. In combination. Yeah, okay. I, 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 all garlic, full a head of garlic. whole one, okay. okay. I chop it in small pieces, mm -hmm. put it in a bowl, I put the yogurt, and I have that with some fruits, like banana or some fruit, okay. and of course, ca cafe, coffee. But really, I am not, I don't like to have a full stomach because I feel very light and very good to work of traveling, seeing the, for the project people, we need to have lunch, dinner, this, another story. But the, so then you the, don't eat till dinner, as, far, yeah, as the, I recall. But I always like to have the evening to the place I eat. I uh, nicely sitting and eating nicely. Okay. But also, uh, when back home, I don't sleep right away. I spend non-creative hours to do something in office. You know, I, my studio on the top floor, and the young people who work with us, they are on the other floors, and I have a pile of things to see in the evening, and this is why. Okay. In talking about these projects, as you just did, the word permission comes up quite a bit. Yeah. And you have certainly encountered your share of hurdles. Um, some of them that I want to just recall here and run and for you was that 
Um, as long ago as 1975, you and Jean-Claude approached the civic authorities in Barcelona, and uh, you had a plan to wrap the nearly 200-foot-tall Columbus Monument at the end of La Rambla Boulevard. And after two years, I think they said no, and then in 1984, the mayor said he wanted to, you to map it, to come and wrap it, and you said, I don't want to do it anymore. Yes. <laughs> Is that true? And then you've encountered resistance on practically every project. The gates, you started in 1979, you didn't complete it until 2005, and that was rejected because they thought it would damage the park. Over the River was fiercely opposed in state and federal court by a group of Coloradans who said it would endanger wildlife and cause other problems in Bighorn Sheep Canyon. Yet you've prevailed in almost every court battle. I prevail also in Over the River. Right. We get the permission. Yes. But we'll I get refuse to, that. to do it. <sighs> Why are these fights worth it and how do you win? Uh, really, the, because all these projects are initiated by me, Jean Claude, myself. And they are each, pro there are no secrets. Why one project we like to do, not to do it later? In the last 50 years, we realized 23 projects and we, we failed to get permission for 47. Some project was refused, and like the rice stack, three times, but still tenaciously like to do it on the gates and the pond. And some project we lost interest, like the project in Barcelona. It was refused twice. And I remember the, that time, the, the last mayor of Barcelona, Pascual de Maragai, who bring the Olympic Games to Barcelona, sent a telegram that time, there was no email. Christo Jean called, build the, come to do the uh, Christopher Columbus. We don't like to do it anymore. We don't like to do it anymore. If we don't like to do it anymore, why should we should do it? You know, like a painter who has a big canvas, he doesn't like to paint that painting anymore. He lost interest, he will not do it. But this is, is the this, fight part of the process? Are, yeah, if, I, no, if it's too no, easy, no, 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 would, it, would you be no, bored? It's not you know, everything in the world belongs to somebody. There's no one square meter of the world don't belong to somebody. You should understand, all this project, we're renting the place. You know very well, we rent. Central Park, you don't know that. We pay $3 million rent to the New York City. We're renting the water in Lake Iseo. We're renting the street in Lake Iseo. You know, for many reasons, this is that we need to be responsible. We don't like to force the project to be used for any other activity. All our projects, they copyrights and trademark that nobody should use, like um, we're in Central Park, that people can bring the dogs, they can run, but no films crew from Hollywood to make films, no anything. The park should live like live, but not capitalize on our present of the project. This is why the same thing, we're at the Reichstag, we're at the Pondorf, and, and uh, this, we were uh, in the, in the, uh, over the river, we're renting 60 miles of federal land. And, and really, this is the part of the independence of the project. And the same thing, we rent in uh, London, it's called Legacy, a more, more uh, elegant way from Royal Park, the water to the water, you're the, renting the water? Yeah the, yeah, the Royal Park is called Legacy that, that we use that area of the water for our project. Let's go back to Over the River in Colorado. It was to have been suspended for two weeks over 42 miles of the Arkansas River. But after spending $15 million on the project, you walked away. I know you didn't want to talk about politics, but yeah, you'll no. have to tell us no, why. That, no, 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 no. I talk about our politics, not politics in general. Okay. The most political project was the Reichstag. We have the real politics, not illustration politics. No, the story like the Reichstag is another story, but for the Central Park, for the for Over the River project, is pure decision. I give right away, faster. We need to get permission from the federal government. It was right federally there. owned land. Federal owned land. It started during the Bush administration, Junior Bush, and we have very difficult time. When Mr. Obama came in power, we worked with the Obama administration through many steps because the federal, uh, the federal government no, would not rent the land if, the, for example, the, the congressional delegation of Colorado support that project. Republican, Democrats support the project, and we succeeded to have that. And they, we have approval by Ken Salazar, who was the Secretary of Interior of the uh, Obama administration. But the, there was opposition in the, that valley, and the opposition took to call Obama administration why they give us permission. And there's uh, many steps we were winning, but they appealed, ta 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 ta, appealed. Uh, and finally, we arrived to the one step before the Supreme Court when the government of the United States have a new president. And I don't like to mention the name, and we don't like to do it anymore. <laughs> That's all. It's my decision why we should spend money that we don't like to do it anymore.
Okay, you don't yeah. want to elaborate on why. I mean, you did talk yeah, no, about how no, no, these but, projects are about freedom, you said. Yeah, no, but freedom, but basically, also, the project, uh, when the project is happened, is put together hundreds of people, thousands of people mm -hmm. of, of a, a relation. I can tell you another project very fast. The RISAC project was the, probably the only project of art in the world was decided to full debate in the parliament of the nation, and we defeated the prime minister. Helmut Kohl, and of course that was something exceptional. We need to talk to a near 600 deputies against the vote to convince them that they have a majority. Um, but uh, the very funny story, the, sp against the speech against the project was delivered that time in 1994 by the very famous, still today, po German politician on near 19 minutes long speech against the project. And that speech was so valuable for us that turned that even conservative member vote for the project. Many years later, the Frankfurt Allgemeine to asked that politician called Wolf, Wolfgang Schäuble, if any and time of your life did something wrong, yes, to vote against the wrapping of the rice. No, <laughs> this is that, the story that that is the project was, but that is the reason we do this project because just to explain you, all our projects have the two distinct periods, software period and hardware period. The software period, the project do not exist. They exist in the mind of people to try to help us and the mind of people who try to stop us. Basically, through all these many, many years, the project developed a relation to people who need to be opposed for the project, and that is the why the project develops his own identity. In 1972, when we started the Reichstag, I have the slightest idea what is the Reichstag. I discovered to the permitting process. That is for all our projects. That is a absolutely essential that the project is developed in that way because I do not know how to do it. This is why after the gates, we have many people ask us to come to another gates. Well, we, not, we know how to do it. Why should we should do the, another gates, another park, another place in the world? This is the any project is like an adventure, like expedition, something so exciting, so new, and so vibrant of rather unexpected story. Another quality of all of your projects is their ephemeral nature. Yeah. They're, they're two weeks sometimes after so yeah. many months of work. Um, is, isn't there a sadness in no. seeing them disappear? And why is that important no. to the I, project I, I, itself? I, I said first, they are also decided for a particular season of the year. For example, the Gates project was decided to be autumn or winter project because we like to have a livery street, to the livery street to see the gate during the summertime. Central Park is like a forest. The way the Surrounded Island project was the spring project because before the hurricane in Miami came later in the season. And they decided for that particular landscape in the umbrella was autumn project. And, and uh, they decided for the aesthetic reason, but that uh, 16 days or 14 days duration, 19 days is arbitrary. That is all I can tell you. This is the most expensive part of the project when it's exhibited. The payroll for the umbrellas in 1991, in Japan and California, a day was near $600,000 a day. For the secu only all the additional people who take care about the things. And after, but why uh, not like, because we need to pay the services, additional highway for the addition, all kind of, we're renting all the space. The government come, but you pay for all these things. And I remember somebody asked Jean Claude, but we are not such at Jean Claude would say, oof, it's over. <laughs> Because it's like it became like your garden or your home and need to be the same Central Park. We need to every morning arriving at five o'clock in the morning and, and see that everything was go smoothly because everything we're responsible. Even the shoveling the snow we're responsible. Everything. So you're saying that you don't want them to be permanent because it's too no, expensive? No, but, oh, no, no. But there is per I did permanent things, no. You have. I did permanent things because I sell permanent things and with that I can have money to build our project. The drawings, sketches, collages, and objects, uh, the sculpture I did in the late 50s, early 60s. And of course, there are some outdoor sculpture with barrels I did. And of course, it will build them, Abu Dhabi Mastaba, will be the permanent sculpture. It will become like Eiffel Tower. Something needs to be kept. It is not, it's not anymore in my things. It should be kept by the people. You should also understand this project, they're not only the things. The case of the Mid Middle East project, Abu Dhabi, is that it's not only we're renting that land, try to have that land. We like to have a 16 square kilometer area reserved for the project. Four kilometer by, is about two and a half miles by two and a half miles. Nothing should be built in that place. Should be exactly what we did. And that is the part of the long permitting process. It's not only 
the things. And all this is the part of our interest, our decision, how to do the work. But you've also talked a lot about how you want it, you don't want it to belong to anyone. You like yeah, the yeah, okay. that the no temporary one owns project, the work. The, the temp of course, the permanent work belongs to somebody, but right. temporary project there, you know, there's something very important. I often they, people say that I wrap things, but actually it's not wrapping, we use fabric, cloth. The cloth is the principal material to translate the nomadic character of this project. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're steel and pole and cables, but the fabric is sold very fast and it's very fragile, it's very sensual, very inviting. Of course, the running fast has nothing to do with wrapping or the, the umbrellas, they're different things, but they know that they are existing in that precious moment that never happened again. And all our projects develop type of special public, they're called groupies. People come from different countries to see the project because every human being is unique, every one of us is a unique person, and this project, they're unique. There will be no another gates. There will be no another Van Curtain or another Refrenics. It was happened. And I remember when Jean-Claude was still alive, we were talking, we were talking like old peasant farmers that on the time of Van Curtain, you know, 72, on the time of Frenic 76, you know, each project has his own time in our life. You often, I mean, obviously Jean-Claude comes up a lot in this conversation, and I know she's very present for you, and when I last interviewed you, it was clear that she was so integral to your personal yeah. and professional life. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about sort of the before and after, and now that you've done projects post-2009, yeah. how is it different working but, uh, without you her? You know, the most, <laughs> I, I, I probably remember that, Jean-Claude was terribly critical, argumentative, <laughs> and, and she was only absolutely critical of everything we do, uh, uh, we do together, arguing. Sometimes in the film of Albert and David Mezzo, there are many films, you can see that we're screaming like we kill each other or divorcing, <laughs> uh, but, but because we're fighting. But another important thing should, uh, you should know, the project cannot be decided in a studio in Manhattan. For all our projects, we need to build life size tests in some secret place. And one-to-one -one scale, small section of project, but with all the real things. First, not only for aesthetic reason, choose the material, the cloth, everything, but also we need to have the force of the wind, the sun, the water, and everything. And we need to find the engineers, we need to find places. And for example, for floating pier, uh, we, we, the permission was unusually fast, and there was no way to make life size test in Italy because everybody will know this. That we have a friend who have a, a property near German and Danish border, and that forest there was the pond of water. And that is the first aesthetical project and life size done with the real dimension, the real material, who we, how we'll be, who are fabric is like every of our projects, the rice stack, the pond, the surrounded island, we all do was done with this very complex uh, uh, test because only in the real light, light, the real sun or water, or rain, we can have the material, we see how they look, how it should be done. And this is the all that, that is during that process with myself, Jean-Claude, and all the people working, but in this also another important thing, this project is not done only by me, Jean-Claude. It's done by fabulous team that we need to put together, and that is the most difficult part. And so and you haven't really answered my question, though, which <laughs> is, you know, working without her now, what's that like? How is that different? Fortunately, I inherited the two nephews. One is my nephew, uh, another is Jean-Claude's nephew. They was running from, they were working over 20 years for Jean-Claude, and I now working for them. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we're going to go to questions, so get them ready. Yeah. Um, do we have mics in the aisles? I guess we have people walking around with mics. Um, but just be before we do, what really strikes me, Christo, whenever I've heard you speak, is that you keep these details in your head. What? That you keep the details, the of measurements. Course. This the is my life. It's not, it's, just amazing. It's, it's all gravity in my... And, and, and who is buying your work? You're managing to sell it all the time, enough to <laughs> yeah, raise well, money for each project? Well, okay. Millions uh, we of have dollars? A, we have a collector, like, you know, collector sent you know, their name, but we have a special type of collector who they are really in depth involved with my work. Basically, they even like to, to witness the process how this project is built. Basically, they're buying they like many it, pieces. Yeah. We are our biggest collector, we have a own museum, is a German collector, Reinhold Ruth. They have a, over 160 pieces. Wow. From the early 1958 to today. The also foundation, uh, uh, 
Lilia Foundation in Switzerland also have many pieces. They are collectors who they are interested not only of the things, but the way how we proceeding, how we how we work with the uh, you know to read our project. You should read or li look at our project. You should read read them like a book. A perfect example, not many congress to write the New York Times, but we uh, we wrap the Reichstag project. The first writers was not art, art, art critic, was architectural writer. Paul Goldberger came to write because Rap Reistek was type of architecture, not painting or sculpture. Basically, the project have so many levels that they're not normal painting or sculpture. There are many, like a construction site, like Army. a road. And if you don't grasp this dimension, you cannot even understand what is the work. Hey, what do you like to be called? An artist? Uh, artist, that's all. Uh, but I study architecture. You I did. know. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Other question? There's a mic here. There's a mic. We there. have time. <laughs> and this is Christo's very, favorite very part. Public. He really wants to hear from you guys. Very so shy, shy. Get public. out of the aisles. Yeah, Get up. Yeah. Usually the. Uh, and go okay, to the, the mic. young lady. Yes. yes. Hi, Christo. My name is Dana. First of all, thank you for the gates. It was a gift to all of us who live in New York. And my question is, I didn't realize how long it took from the conception of the gates to when it came to fruition. And what made you so passionate about that project that you stuck with it for the so gate. many years? The gate. You know, uh, the answer is little, not long, I don't make it short. You know, when, when I arrived in the United States, we were in SS France, we arrived from uh, uh, the Rosano Bridge, not yet put together, just closing. And, and I see that this huge skyline, and of course, it was very natural in the mid 60s, I proposed the rap building, number two Broadway in number 20 exchange place, downtown Manhattan, but I never succeeded to get permission. A little later, we have a friend, the collectors, and they are, uh, may, um, helped me because I already was eager to wrap number one Times Square. That time was Allied Chemical Corporation. And, and I succeeded to talk to the chairman of the board and all these people, but also they say no. Now, this is like in the late 60s, in the 60s and the 70s, we spent most in the West. The Valley Cut and Running Friends and Kansas City. And, and I remember looking from far, from far, I see the most important thing in Manhattan is the people. That the people walk in the street. They walk. I never see so many people walking. And, and, and I think we should do something involving people walking. And some moment was thinking to do something in the street, but forget it. We can never get permission to do that. And suddenly, we have this absolutely man-made park, cut out of any connection to any vegetation, uh, uh, confined with these uh, city blocks, rectangular city blocks. And, and people go inside in the park and that natural space, but actually also man-made space because everything is designed. And we, this is why we decided to do something that energize the space between you feet, the first branches of the tree that you walk in the park, but nothing happens around you. You look at the tree, etc. And this is how it became the gates now. Why not arch? Why the gates? Because the gates ref reflect the footprint, footprint of the city blocks, rectangular shape, not roundish, where the fabric hanging free from the horizontal part is like the branches of the tree moving in all directions, organic shape, that mixture between geometry and the organic shape in the city was embodied in the, in the, in the form of the gates. And of course, it's extremely intimate because usually walking in the walk in Central Park is open. You don't have a sense of the, 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 the direction of the walkway because it's the only new look down. You suddenly have these very close gates together with this saffron color. You're directed to go to that and all that this is why I choose also to do it in the winter. There is no vegetation, that all these silver gray uh, branches of the tree. And if you have snow, Jean-Claude, we're not sure we have snow, but we have twice snow. All that was worked perfectly with the saffron color fabric. <laughs> OK, next, yes. Um, Krista, I'm so excited to see you and hear you. And thank you. I was fortunate to see the Pont Neuf and also the gates. So I have two questions. Um, all the fabric materials that you make, how long does it take for you to uh, get it organized and manufactured? And how are you getting it f funded? And then after two I'm weeks, what yeah. happens to all the fabric okay, and all okay, the materials okay, that okay. you have? What's happened with the material? Basically, 
a huge amount of industrial material. First, the fabric is not clothing fabric. It's, induced, it's called industrial textile. It's a big business around the world. It's used for construction job, environmental purposes, agricultural purposes. And of course, it's the less expensive part of all the projects. The most project is expensive is the labor. That is not compact. But to give you an example of the Rapkos on Australia, what we did it. Rapkos Australia, the fiber was called erosion control mesh. It's not round fiber, it's flat fiber, it's woven, and it's widely used for the farmers in South Pacific against the typhoon who removed the good earth. The farmers put that <laughs> cloth over the good earth and the crops can grow to the fiber. And this is the, how the fabric of the uh, uh, Rapkos in Australia was absolutely recycled for the farmers. Each of these fabric, they recycle right away. But, they, but that is the minuscule in, in the amount of money. The hardware is much more. For example, we bought 5,000 tons of steel to install the gates for Central Park. It's not worth 5,000 tons. 5,000 tons of steel is three quarters of the steel of Eiffel Tower. We bought it in Pennsylvania. There was the Chinese need so much steel. We even saw, saw the steel before was used for Central Park to the Chinese. <laughs> You know, you know it's very, I am educated Marxist. I am used the capitalist system to the very end. It's very <laughs> simple things. It's very simple things. You know, they're not in waste. They're all valuable material. We try to uh, find their place. There's also boats, like for Lake Isay, we have so many boats. Of course, we sell them after that. All, many, many things, you know, many, all is used in that way. Over the river was going to cost 50 million. Yeah, yeah. London's 4.2 million. The Gates was 16.8 million. Is there one that's the, the, the Gates? No, the Gates is 21 million. 21 million. What yeah. has been the no. most expensive project? The most expensive project, of course, unavoidable, is the umbrella because it was project two parts simultaneously. It was near 20. Which one? The umbrellas in Japan oh, and California the because they're two projects. And 1991 it cost about near 30 million dollars. Today is about. 60 more above 60 million dollars. <laughs> yes, next. Uh, hey, I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about your works today. I grew up with the, the cloth hanging over the canyon in my Body bedroom. Curtain. So every morning when I woke up, I woke up looking at that and I was in high school when the gates came out and I walked across the park every day to look at them. So really love the work. And my favorite, parts of the my favorite part of the gates I think was the day it started when you did the unveiling and everybody yeah. gathered and watched okay. the unveiling. And so I was interested if you could talk a little bit more about when you're designing the unveiling experiences and other interactions people have with the works, how you think about that and- Opening. Yeah, yeah opening and- so, You know, first, the, all the projects have a, a principal work force. They're fabricated off-site. Many, many things fabricated off-site. And they all come, we have a, a MOSFET, our big working yard, when the material was right, like the, all the base for the gates, all the poles and all that fabric was, but like all the project in the very end was done by professional, all the installation, the heavy duty thing. But at the very end, we hire non-skilled workers to install the project, like the case of the gates, you know. They go to the training in the MOSFET and the Queens, and to learn what we do, the entire project was divided in teams because we like to open it, the, the gates project was involving 7,000 gates need to be divided in so many groups of people. And of course, after that, they became guardian of the project, literally guardian. They need to care about the work that everybody, they need to clean things. And of course, we always cut thousands of million little samples of fabric that we give to the people walking around for souvenir, like that, that, is, mm -hmm. that is, we do that. And this is that, all the projects have these professional workers and non-professional workers. And there they, they are so many facets to tell you. The, I give you this story because it's so funny. The project of Umbrella was a project in two parts to highlight the difference between the two richest countries in the world that time, United States and Japan and the early 90s. And like any project after construction going, now we need to hire young students in California and, Japan, and all included in Japan to do the finally to install the gates. And we in Los Angeles University and like lecture like that, they need to uh, come and explain the project. And the first question from the American students, how much the project would cost you, who pay? <laughs> we are flying the next day to Japan. And the first question from a Japanese student, why yellow, why blue? 
OK. You know, this is many comparisons in that order. There are many, many. The project reveals so much what is the human being surrounded. Okay. Yes. I, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to hear you speak and just to take the time to speak to all of us. Um, so, so much of your work so beautifully captures the ephemerality of nature, kind of uh, the movement of the winds, how the shape of trees and vegetation and water. Um, but have you ever had interest in working with materials of nature, working with trees, moving dirt, yeah. manipulating water in a way that's more permanent than some of the man-made materials that you move and then take down? Yeah. And what is the question I feel? The, qu the question is, is uh, about using materials that are not, like a project that's not so temporary, one that is maybe using vegetation, more more using serious, dirt. More yeah. steady material. But you know. The, but, the, but materials that are as ephemeral as the fabrics. Yeah, but or the project, you know, the, technically the project, is a lot of very steady material. But the, I say the cloth is the most principal element to translate this vulnerability of the project. But the barrels project will be sturdy material. And we have, there are also so much uh, involving things that you cannot even see it. In, in the floating pier, we need to install so much sturdy materials. The, all these projects have very, of these elements. They technically can stay if they're kept, if they're taken around and cleaning, but this is something we don't like to do. The important part is that the work is so, uh, um, how put it, totally useless. <laughs> with no reason to exist. The reason exists because myself, Jean-Claude, and some friends like to have it, and it have nothing except what this is, the work. And, and, and it cannot be bought, cannot be possessed, cannot be taken care of. And I, coming out from communist country, I escape, really, walking in the woods, and, and uh, I do not give millimeter of my freedom for this project. I'm opinionated, I can cancel things, and I cancel, if they're done and the way I should be done, I am absolutely total freedom, irresponsible, irrational, and that is translated with that freedom in this project. And this they can stay because the, the project will stay is permanent. And uh, permanence is some against the freedom. This is why they go and they have something uh, that every human being like to have once in a lifetime. And, and, and this is something uh, happened because happened is not only the project happened time, it happened in the circumstance of human exists and that in that time. It cannot be repeated, it cannot be, it cannot be can. Actually, I think any work of art that, you know that, is that. We go to the Louvre or to the Metropolitan Museum, we see white sculpture, they're not white. And we build entire civilization of white sculpture. They was never been white. They was all painted, you know. This is the really, uh, the idea we, we think we see the real thing is very relative, but that's another big story. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, next. Dobar večer. Novo se radvam da vada tuk. It's an honor. Um, I have a question coming from the same place. What, from who? Co coming from the same place, where are you coming from? Um, can you please, I've seen um, great exhibitions of you in Sofia. Uh, I've seen great projects of your student life, and that's how I know your name. To um, Bulgaria. I'm sorry? To Bulgaria? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I, have a, I have a question. Um, how come, how like after building those beautiful like small projects, how this, um, how a project is coming to life. For example, how did you, did your first project, how like your big mo monumental project, how you, how you made it happen? <laughs> how, do you remember, no, do you remember no, any? Uh, uh, you mean uh, early days? Early yes. days. In the beginning. If, uh, you know, if, if you, you do it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you do it. I, I cannot give you a recipe how it happened. First thing, but you, you should understand, probably uh, uh, I'm enjoying that software period of the project, which is only in the conversation and the permitting process, because it's something incredibly uh, gratifying. 
uh, and, and uh, I love to talk to people, to convince them to do things. Give an example. This is so enchanting. To do the Umbrellas project, there was the 16 miles in, uh, in California, 13 miles in, in Japan. And 16 miles, we have only 24 cowboy ranchers. And uh, Los Angeles is Kent County. Mm -hmm. On the land, we need to rent it. In Japan, and 30 miles, we have 469 Japanese rice field farmers. The youngest was 62, the oldest was in somewhere in the 90s. Nobody of them speak English. Jean Claude was saying we need to drink probably 6,000 cups of green tea, but <laughs> that's all that. But now, they give you an example. There was the, the landowners, but also there was the government, in the <laughs> state, state, gov state of California, and the federal government, because we said a lot. In Japan also, there was the state of Ibaraki in the central government of Tokyo. Now, we even, we have so many ranchers, uh, uh, rice field farmers in Japan, we never have problems. The government of, of uh, Japan and Tokyo was a hell of a problem. And California was the other way around. The federal government, the state of California, was so supportive in Ken, Ken County, in Los Angeles County, but 26 cowboy ranchers was a hell of a problem. <laughs> no, but this is to tell you the story of this project. They reflect what we love to do that. And that is the, the unforgettable experience, and something is like a, a habit forever is stay with ever. Now, why I'm not come to Bulgaria? Because, you know, yeah. to do this project is so consuming time. I do this project not putting my finger on the maps like that. I do this project because in that area, people, they're interested in my art. The first uh, outdoor project, Jean-Claude, myself, we did it in Cologne, Germany in 1961. I'm not German, but since 1961, we have so many collections in Germany. If so many people like my work in Germany, certainly we did the Reichstag project. The same thing, I'm not Italian, but I have so many collectors in Italy. I have uh, did projects, Swiss project, I have so many collectors. The same, I'm not Australian, or um, this, all this. This is where I say, where are the Bulgarian collectors? <laughs> 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 there are no single collectors on the scale that we have it in any other country. This is why we don't do projects in China. I have, don't care about China. I don't care in any uh, South America. We have few collectors, but no comparison with the collectors we have another country. This is very natural relation and, and, and it's, it's happened, it's okay. human. Thanks, Thank yes, next. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with you live. I've been following your work for many, 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 many years. And I have on my wall, um, when you did the gates, you yes. were selling small prints yeah, that, that you that, signed. Okay. The posters, yeah. Yeah. Not well, original. I have one and I love it. <laughs> Not um, original, okay. And I live right by the reservoir, so yeah. it's meaningful. Okay, well, um, my question is about uh, political, like, do you think of yourself as a political artist? Because I'm hearing things that you're saying that touch on public art in many ways, um, creating art outside of museums, in the public, for everyone. Um, the whole issue of freedom, which no, you're talking no, but about. Really, let, um, this is an artistic question, but I try to explain you. You know, <laughs> the, this project deals with space. You know, the f uh, painting is flat surface like that. Yeah. And the sculpture is something like that. You know. And you go around the space. And sometimes sculpture is very big. Alexander Calder can kind of walk inside. And that is the really the traditional, three-dimensional, and sometimes you can install television or something, but basically that is the space all organized by the artist. Yes. The another space we know very little about. The moment you walk out of your home, somebody designed the sidewalk. You cross the street, you have a red and green light. Basically, 24 hours around the clock, you open into highly reglamented space with so many meanings that you don't think, but actually we're conducted all that. And Jean Claude was always saying, we like to borrow that space it created gentle disturbance for a few days. While we're borrowing that space, we inherit everything in that space to become the work of art. Mm -hmm. We don't invent the politics in the rice tech, because in the real rice tech, but the real. Because today, artists do politics, but illustration of politics, not the real things. There are very different between illustration and the film or photograph or the video, ta 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 ta, than the real things. And now projects have the real politics. You know how much time is spent in the couloir, in the corridor in Washington for the, the river project. 
talking, like lobbying, put it that way. Yeah. I pay lawyers, not simple. But that is the real things, the real. And that is the why I say I like the real things. No <laughs> fake, no virtual, no lie, no photography, no anything, films. Like, for example, the, my study for the Gates was about the Gates. Uh -huh. The film about the Gates. The photography about the Gates. But for 16 days, and 2001 was the gates mm -hmm. and the real center part with the real snow, with the real sun, the real things. That is the real, this is the, this is the important. This is why we like to do this project because they deal with the real thing. We don't do that to have politics. We do that because what is the, the things? We need to define who owns the things, how the, to rent it, how, and that is the real things. Not, we're not, ma how the ma masochists to have more problems. <laughs> we like to have a less problem. Uh, but we never have less problems. But Always Christo, problems. when you decided not to do Over the River, people were talking about it as one of the biggest protests of Donald Trump early in his presidency. Mm -hmm. Do you not own that, that that was a, a protest of sorts? No, no of certainly, a political certainly, no, no, certainly all this project, because I try to have my freedom, absolutely, and I didn't like to do the project, you know, I cannot have, I don't know how to pronounce them, she or he come to my project. And I have often need to welcome somebody to come to my project when he's, when he's exhibited. Okay. Uh, no, in the sun, I have that things, for example. I can tell you frankly, no story. When uh, Mrs. Bush arrived in Central Park, I was not in Central Park. Do you, does okay. the word activist. Find me, but I was not in Central Park. Okay, I think I want to give someone okay. else a turn because we're running out of time. Hi, I'm Heidi. I am from Germany, and I'm one of your early collectors. Uh, I worked with the Manus Presse, so yeah, yeah, I actually yeah. visited you one time with Jean-Claude in uh, Soho, yeah, many, yeah. many years ago. Many years, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually not a question, it's really a praise I wanted to give you by seeing some of the projects like the Gates. I took friends who were not really into your art, as we call it, and I convinced them to go and walk Many days we walked and see the art in nature, as you say, and how it changes. You're not just standing under the flag and, and see a piece of orange yeah. clothes. You see it at different times of the day, at different lights and with the wind, and how yeah. it changed. And they were all so enthusiastic. And I thought that you okay. should know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's yes, a good question. <laughs> Yeah. My question is, do you view your contracts and negotiations as art? And also, what lessons have you learned? Of course. I'm a dialectic Marxist. I, everything is part of art, even the Colorado negotiations. I can tell you, after the Gates, uh, we have a call for Harvard Business School, because Harvard Business School teach by cases. And the Harvard Business School, how now the Gates, a case about Bill Gates, a case of uh, Steve Jobs, and the case of Christo Jean Claude, how they finance their project. It's no secret, you can click there, it's about 30 pages case. And it basically, everything is part of the project. Even the, our relation with the bankers, relation with the contractor, with everything, is the part, is all, all that is the work of art. They, they engage like any, the, 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 the aesthetic and, and the dimension, discussion, everything, even the permitting process, of course, is a part of the project. Okay, we have last two questions and we're gonna have to stop. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I really love your art and I have a question about the idea of wrapping. Where did you get, when you wrap monuments, for me, wrapping is you wrap gifts for birthday. So is this something from your childhood that you... Uh, uh, what is the meaning of the wrapping? Okay. You know, uh, <laughs> some project is the wrapping, like a cost in Australia and the rice tag. But the perfect example of what meaning of the wrapping is the case of the French sculptor Rodin. Rodin had a commission to do the figure of Balzac, a French novelist. In the first version, that is a true story, not invented by me, that Balzac was totally naked, big belly, skinny legs, and many details. What Rodin did it, take the cape of Balzac, shroud it around. Today we have Balzac Museum of the Art and Boulevard Espanol. Basically, he hides all this detail in the body. He highlights principal proportion of the body of Balzac. The same thing we do with wrapping project. 
then we don't have the rice stack like that. We built so many things to have this cascading fabric to highlight the rice stack was full of window with the sculptures, decoration, there was all hidden. And this, that 14 days, the rice stack was looking like a giant sketch. But in like the study of the, all these pictures here, they're not static pictures. They're all motion all the time. They're moving with the wind. They're moving with every, they're not, they're not done on steel or bronze or wood. And this is the wrapping. But after that, other project is have the dimension. But in story of the cloth is in the art is all the like the art actually can recognize the stylistic, stylistic period, like in the medieval sculpture, the fold the most angular and the Renaissance and the Baroque and Michelangelo Bernini, more flamboyant. There is so much fabric is so much in the history of art, in the fresco and the sculpture for a thousand years. Okay, last question. Yeah. Yes. I would like to know a little bit the contribution of Jean-Claude to, to the work. So to hear you know, how she was, uh, to hear if she was talking a lot in public, because they don't know much. <laughs> Thank you. you know, no, Jean-Claude was, I tell, Jean-Claude was everything. You know, we cannot do a project with uh, her. That was impossible. She was doing, and actually the Surrounded Island was her idea. And but basically, you know, she was always saying that idea, everybody can have idea. But to make it is the most difficult part. And I say, this is the most important part of our project, to have this very critical attitude. And I, I myself, I always doubt of everything, everything, what happened. And today, we need to talk with the, my nephew, with the friends who work with us, and discussing how, how the things happen. They cannot be substituted. OK, thank you, Christo. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for you. Thank you.